Good morning. People are still uh, joining us, but I think we'll just get started because we have lots of panelists and a fantastic subject, and I don't want to keep anybody waiting, and I want to cover as much material as we possibly can. So, hello and welcome. I'm Melinda Crane, and it is my pleasure to moderate our ITF session this morning on constructing supply chains of the future, how shifts in global economic balance affect transport. As you know, this forum's devoted do I? Yes, I do. <laughs> Devoted this year to this microphone shine a bisschen. Ne? Doch? Okay. A third time to transport for a changing world. Changes in the realm of supply chain management are absolutely huge. Es geht schon immer wieder. Soll ich lieber ein Handmikro nehmen? Schon, oder? Good. Machen wir einfach. So I'm going to use a hand microphone. That means I'm going to be shuffling my papers from time to time, and I'll just ask you to bear with me while I do that. <laughs> and actually, I'll just keep talking like this, and maybe sometimes you'll hear me, and uh, if we're lucky, you'll hear me even when the mic is not working. Changes in the realm of supply chain management are huge. Whether you're a shipper or a transport company, whether you buy, sell, or regulate logistics, you are seeing a fundamental transformation in trade flows. A massive geographic dispersal of both supply and demand means that supply chains are more complex and more fragmented than ever before. The shift in the global economic center of gravity away from advanced economies toward emerging ones may see reduced growth on international trade routes, for example, such as the North Atlantic. And of course, we're also seeing a massive dispersal even within those emerging economies, more demand and more different centers of production. Meanwhile, profit margins are shrinking, shelf lives are compressing, so cost and time pressures just keep on going up. New business models are emerging that reconfigure supply chains around customers. All those trends put a huge premium on flexibility and on optimization, but that doesn't mean that those two necessarily correspond. How do we construct supply chains in the future that synchronize global supply and demand in the face of the kind of transformations I'm mentioning about and which we will explore in greater detail this morning? What are the implications for transport infrastructure, including port competitiveness and hinterland connections? Which cost-effective solutions best enhance the connectivity of supply chains and the reliability of transport? And who, governments, shippers, transport companies, others, who is best suited to be responsible for which part solutions? We've got a fantastic panel to address all of these issues, and we also want to hear from you as well, ladies and gentlemen, in the course of the morning. And I will now begin by asking our keynote speaker to give us a scene setter. She is Dorothée Baer, and she is Parliamentary State Secretary at the Federal Ministry of Transport and Digital Infrastructure here in Germany, with responsibility for coordinating freight transport and logistics. She's been a member of the German Parliament since 2002. A very warm welcome to you, Dorothée Baer. So, good morning, everyone. I hope my microphone is working and first of all I want to thank you very much for coming to Germany and thank you very much for getting up this early to join our discussion today. Um, as Melinda Crane said, um, I'm responsible for transport and logistics here in Germany and for me transport and logistics systems, they connect people, they connect our nations and they play a crucial role in determining our economic success. We have transport and logistics from the foundation for trade, the exchange of goods and production based on the division of labor. They enable us to enjoy an unprecedented degree of mobility and transport and logistics are a major basis of our prosperity and at the same time one of the most important prerequisites as a major driver of globalization. Freight, transport and logistics are mainstays of any economic development. 
and this applies not only the competitiveness of highly developed industrialized countries, but also to emerging economies and the economic development of nations whose economies are still weak. Freight transport and logistics form an indispensable foundation of industrial production. And without them, flows of goods and traffic and cooperation between good producing companies would not be possible in first place. It is not possible to participate in an increasingly globalized economy and those safeguard jobs and create new ones unless logistic networks are sufficiently well developed. And those, for instance, we are stepping up the level of funding for our transport infrastructure by providing over the next four years an additional 5 billion euros. Because in Germany we know that the renewal and upgrading of our transport networks is of fundamental importance for a modern mobility and infrastructure policy that is designed to ensure prosperity and employment in our country. In any economy, freight transport and logistics are the lifeblood of those sectors that produce goods and are characterized by the division of labor. In recent years, many states have realized just how important logistics is for economic growth. And new players have taken their place alongside the established logistics centers in Europe and as well in Asia. And as globalization increases, freight movements no longer come to a stop at national borders. An increasingly diverse range of goods is being moved over increasingly long distances. As mile ages increase, the formation of transport chains and the organization of the supply chains are becoming more and more important. And here it is apparent that throughout the world, supply chains are influenced by the same trends and the logistic centers face comparable challenges. By way of example, I would just like to mention the rising volume of traffic and the increasing number of containers handled at the seaports. Environmental protection and climate change mitigation plus the onward march of globalization involve a rising division of labor worldwide, an increasing number of freight movements, and thus a growth in levels of freight traffic. And this will be among the mega trends of the years and decades ahead. And at the same time, the requirements of environmental protection and the need for freight movements are no longer seen as mutually exclusive. Companies now realize that environmental protection is not only important, but society demands it, not only in Germany, and that at the same time it provides scope for cutting costs. And there is likely to be a high rate of growth in freight traffic in the years ahead. And so one of our most important policy objectives is to shape this increase in traffic levels such that mobility is facilitated and at the same time the environmental and climate change targets to which the federal government has committed itself are achieved. And many companies have also set themselves the goal of creating environmentally sound and resource efficient logistical processes. They are using modern drivetrain technologies. They are training their drivers in fuel efficient driving and using software to plan their routes. All this illustrates two things. In our world, with its international division of labor, efficient transport solutions are no longer matters for national governments alone, and they affect the public and private sectors in equal measure. If we are to manage the rising levels of traffic, we not only need national solutions, but we really must also engage in an international exchange of ideas and experience, especially since the challenges I mentioned confront not just Germany, but every country in the world. And for this reason, let me say welcome again to you. Let me say thanks for listening, and I'm really looking forward to our discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, State Secretary Barron. May I just ask you to join me here on the stage uh, in this place, and then we will ask all of our other panelists to join us as well, and we can begin with our discussion. So if you will join me here, please. And um, Minister, if you will join me here. And Mr. Susantono, that would be your place right there. Very good.
Thank you very much for your remarks. And we want to pick up on a number of those issues now in our panel discussion. And it is my great honor to introduce our panelists, starting with the gentleman on my right hand. His Excellency Abdullah al nuwaimi is, is Minister of Public Works for the United Arab Emirates and responsible for developing infrastructure and public buildings in the Emirates. He also serves as chairman of the Sheikh Zayed Housing Program and of the National Transport Authority. Authority. A warm welcome to you, sir. It's great that you can be with us. And next to Madam Baer is Bambang Susantono. He is Indonesia's Vice Minister of Transportation. He is also President of Indonesia's Intelligent Transport System, and he serves on the board of the International Environmental Foundation South South North Group. A warm welcome to you as well. And it is my great pleasure to introduce Jeroen Eysink. He has been Chief Executive Officer of DHL Freight Germany since 2013, having previously headed DHL Freight Belgium, Netherlands, and UK. He's also a member of the DHL Freight Management Board. Prior to joining Deutsche Post DHL, Mr. Eysink spent over seven years in management at Siemens AG. Thanks so much for being here. And it's a pleasure to welcome Chris Tyus. He's been with Nestle for 30 years. He's currently group head of supply chains and previously headed Nestle's supply chain for Europe. He joined supply chain at its creation in the mid-1990s, helping create the function in the UK. He's been active in many industry bodies, including the organization Efficient Consumer Responses Europe Supply Chain Committee. A warm welcome. Umberto Di Preto is Secretary General of the International Road Transport Union. He joined the IRU in 1995 as Head of Economic Affairs, has also served as its Policy Coordinator and Head of Strategy, and he was previously Deputy Director of the International Chamber of Commerce. Great, you can be with us. And next to Mr. Depreto, Marcus Rosemann is Global Head of Logistics and Order Fulfillment at SAP. As such, he works with companies around the world on global supply chain solutions and processes, and he bears responsibility for segments ranging from transportation to warehouse management and product tracking. A warm welcome to you, Mr. Rosemann. So I'd like to start out by getting a couple more country perspectives, and I'll go first to the Emirates. Your region, of course, typifies many of the changes that we're witnessing. You have an absolutely burgeoning demand, a growing middle class, a huge youth population, that so-called youth bulge. For a long time, Mideast trade was seen as a pretty simple matter. You had oil and gas going out, and you had everything else coming in. How is that changing, and how does that affect your work, transport and logistics, in the Emirates? First of all, I should uh, thank you very much for, uh, uh, for the introduction. And I should also thank the uh, International uh, uh, Transport Forum for, uh, for this uh, session. And I, I think it's great to have a few opinions on the uh, um, uh, trend of the future uh, supply chain. Uh, in the United Arab Emirates, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, we've, we have a, 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 a good story to tell. Uh, about 10 years ago, we realized that there is uh, a swift on the, in the uh, international economy where uh, due to the, to the weak performance of the industries in the West and the usage of the East, we felt that the location of the United Arab Emirates might give it uh, a great uh, importance to assist on the on the uh, chain and in the future uh, chain where uh, uh, if we look into into the ports in the united arab emirates we have major ports in jabal ali we are handling over 25 million uh, container in in a single uh, uh, port uh, we also have uh, uh, ports that 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 manage uh, um, other 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 uh, seaports uh, worldwide in the United Arab Emirates, we felt that it is essential to uh, complete the chain by having uh, a, a good infrastructure as far as road to link to the sea and airports. Uh, we have, uh, we have a, a, a decent link between air and sea. 
uh, our infrastructure as far as road is probably uh, compared to uh, uh, in, in terms of quality and connectivity, uh, we're probably in the in the high five worldwide. Uh, as far as the uh, uh, ability to improve uh, uh, the uh, the regulatory systems within the United Arab Emirates, we are probably one of the first countries in the region where we uh, realize that there is a need for uh, logistic that links the world trade or the world future trade uh, within within the UAE. Uh, we are actually the first country in the region that established uh, regulation for the usage of roads and how we link it to the to the to the to the uh, 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 tracking systems worldwide uh, we are also uh, we have also linked this with the tier uh, uh, and we are uh, operating uh, uh, probably we are the first to link the tier in the uh, regulation of the united arab emirates uh, we are preparing for the for the swift as a matter of fact uh, that is that is something where uh, uh, we also have uh, a, a port uh, uh, and airports uh, within within the region uh, dubai airports abu dhabi airports are the major ones but we have other five that cater for the same uh, united arab emirates as far as infrastructure is 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 well established to take the uh, change and to be part of the future uh, 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 change May I just ask you one follow-up question in relation to the region as a whole. As you say, Emirates, very well placed, sees itself as a hub of the future. If you look at uh, performance indexes for logistics, Emirates is way up there. Its ranking is, I think, 3.78 on a scale of 1 to 5. That's high. That's as high as a country like Sweden, for example. But other studies say that the region as a whole, MENA region, punches below its weight consistently. How much does that limit your ability to real, realize your own aspirations and what needs to happen uh, many uh, i uh, the region the region is probably now getting getting the message right uh, maybe we have an advantage where we got it 10 years ago and we felt that we should be prepared uh, the region today is 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 getting ready to 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 put uh, uh, formulas together many challenges uh, faces the whole region uh, the swift is too fast and uh, very complicated the infrastructure uh, within within the region need to be uh, uh, regulated need to be need to be operated within systems uh, there are many challenges within the region however uh, if the united arab emirates manage to do it i'm quite sure that all the region can uh, do it as well that's a very optimistic view. Uh, I'd like to ask Umberto de Preto to tell us a little bit about his experience in the region. I know that the IRU is working closely and intensively in that area. Where do you see challenges and issues going forward? What I love about these debates is we can look at the future, and that's very inspiring, saying this is what we should strive for. But we cannot lose sight of the fact that today there are problems, and, and we do have problems that, that need to be addressed. Uh, and, and to understand the complexity when we say, you know, constructing supply chains, today's supply chain, to have a cup of coffee in Bourg de Four in Geneva, you require 29 companies from 18 countries just to have that simple cup of coffee, just to understand how complex the systems are today, let alone talking about building the future. But when we're constructing the future, we need, like with any construction, a good foundation. And today we don't have that foundation. If we could go back to the Arab world, just to give an example, in the Arab world, 57% of transport time is lost at borders, 57%. If we then factor into that as well, the additional transport cost because of a, I'll use the Arabic expression, bakshish, 30% of transport cost is attributable to corruption. That is an additional 30%. So how do we get rid of that? Now, the Emirates has taken a leadership role in this, and, and hats off to His Excellency for doing this, by implementing tried and tested UN instruments, that is the Harmonization Convention and the Tier Convention. And by doing this, we can reduce these border waiting times. And not only in the Middle East, and, and other countries will look to the Emirates and say, ah, if this is what they're doing, we should try to emulate that. And, and this is what we need to then drive trade throughout the Middle East, throughout the Arab world, and as well to be able to drive trade make them more uh, interdependent 
and bring down those barriers. But then we have to go beyond uh, the Arab world and then let's say into Africa. And if we look at Africa, then the situation is even more dire. We have some countries where 75% of the truck time, 75% is just sitting there doing nothing. 60% of the perishable goods perish before they're ever delivered to market. And so the challenge is out there. And so we say we want to build supply chains of the future, but already today we have to set the basic foundation, and that is put in place the instruments that will allow us to drive this change, to allow these supply chains to be put in place in a very, very efficient way. It's a complex um, chain, and we can put in place very simple instruments that the moment that a country signs within six months, we can already facilitate trade and get things moving. It, of course, uh, wasn't called a supply chain back then, but the old Silk Road, of course, was one of the main routes that uh, took uh, goods east to west and west to east for a long, long time. Your organization, the IRU, says that old Silk Road could be revived as a modern supply chain, but again, you point to major procedural and institutional barriers, including corruption, which you just mentioned. What can an organization like the IRU do to try to uh, move things in those areas? Uh, best practices, sharing, uh, institutional support, what are you doing? Most people, well, first is bring recognition to the real problem. Most people would think that between, let's say, China and Europe, the biggest obstacle is infrastructure. And what we did is we ran a number of caravans to demonstrate, firstly, the infrastructure is there. The biggest impediment faced are procedures. Uh, the United Nations actually did an analysis saying if we were to rebuild an entire highway from China to Europe, and you can imagine the billions it would take, you would reduce transport time by 3.9 days. 3.9 days after spending billions and billions to build that highway. Instead of just putting in place and implementing the procedures, and you would save 4.1 days for nothing. So our role is to bring to the attention of governments that tried and tested United Nations instruments, and not of the RU, they're UN instruments <coughs> created to facilitate trade, to secure trade, and to eliminate the environment at borders that is conducive to corruption, eliminating the environment at borders that is conducive to illicit activities, the spread of AIDS, to, to other uh, phenomena that we see at borders. And, and this corruption, the only way that we can get rid of it at borders is from a top-level decision from the president of a country to say, enough is enough. Because with every impediment that we face at a border, the economy suffers, the environment suffers, the people suffer. I know that border management issues are one of the things that Indonesia is targeting, Mr. Susantono. I'd like to ask you about some of the challenges that your country faces. Many emerging markets, of course, are in countries of very significant land mass, and factories are now increasingly scattered across a very wide geographic area. But your country, with 17,000 plus islands, uh, I, I tried to get an exact count, and Every website seemed to have a different number, but you, in any event, your country, of course, faces some major issues in terms of geographic dispersal. Your performance on the World Bank's Logistics Performance Index is middling. In fact, it, your rating has decreased somewhat in recent years, apparently because other countries are rising. Um, what are you doing to face the challenges? Yeah, first of all, if we are talking about the global supply chains, we are talking about uh, uh, movement, distribution of uh, goods from the origin to final destinations, right? And uh, usually the, the backbone of the supply chains is okay, but the last chain is a problem. Actually, if we are talking about the emerging uh, countries or the developing countries. In our case, yes, you're right, we have uh, 17,000 islands. We are spanning, spanning from east to west, like from the Dublin from to uh, Moscow, actually. We have three time zones. Yeah? We have 245 million people, and we have uh, 2,392 ports, actually. Yeah? You, you can imagine the scale that uh, we are facing. Uh, our uh, logistic performance index is, is still uh, not so good. We are not satisfied with that. Uh, based on the latest World Bank survey, for example, uh, we identify that 50 to 60 percent of the backlog or of the, uh, uh, let's say, the problems uh, coming with the, uh, uh, the procedures or trade facilitations. And the others is for the infrastructure. So not only infrastructure, but also 
the, uh, the, the, the procedure or trade facilitation that creates a problem. So what, what, what can we do with that? Uh, we target three things, actually. The first one is what we call on the hard infrastructure or hardware. Yes, of course, we have to, uh, to uh, modernize our uh, uh, facilities in port, for example, by uh, uh, adding, uh, uh, let's say, uh, facilities uh, to, uh, uh, to cater with all the demand for the more, uh, let's say, uh, big ships that are now emerging. But uh, this is not uh, cheap because we have to uh, uh, fund all the uh, facilities that we would, would like to build. Yeah? Uh, that, that's number one, the infrastructure in the port or the airport or on the uh, logistic uh, facilities. Second one is on the software side, on the soft infrastructure. We try to make everybody uh, electronic so that uh, transparency and accountability can uh, deter or can prevent all the not good government issues, right? And one joke right now that I have from colleagues from the logistic uh, players is that when you track your container uh, uh, from outside to Indonesia, you can track it, but when, within the port, you cannot uh, know, you, do, you don't know where is it, yeah? <laughs> and when it goes outside the port, then you can track it again. So it's like a black box in the, in the port itself. So we try to deal with that by uh, implementing what we call the electronic platform so that again transparency and accountability can be uh, can be you know uh, can be found in every uh, of ports the third one is also equally important because we are developing countries is the labor issues what we call the brainware yes we can uh, modernize our port but if you modernize your port you have also to uh, try to uh, 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 increase the capacity of the labor because otherwise you have a lot of resistance. Yeah? Uh, let me give you an example. If you try to uh, uh, make uh, the uh, bulk uh, issues containerizations, yes, your efficiency can increase 300%, but you will uh, lose about eight, 50 to 85% of the labor force. Yeah. So in this case, we have to deal with the labor union. Yeah. That's not easy by all means. And so again, these three are, uh, has to be done together because otherwise uh, one of them will, you know, will uh, hamper all the, uh, the progress of the uh, yeah, logistic issues. Yeah. Let me ask you a very brief follow-up just on two, of, uh, two points related to those. Uh, first of all, in terms of hardware infrastructure, uh, the World Bank in its Logistics Performance Index recommended that maybe Indonesia ought to be thinking about a new deep water port. Is that something you're exploring? And then secondly, perhaps very briefly, uh, national single window. What is it, and are you doing it, and do you hope it, is it working? Yes, the first one is that, yes, we are now trying to, uh, uh, how you call it, rearrange the hierarchy of the port, because we cannot, in the same, play, in the same time, developing all the 2,392 2, ports altogether. We have to have a hub and spoke system, yeah? So five major ports is going to uh, be revived very soon, revitalized very soon, and also, has to be in the same standard with our, you know, uh, one of our uh, partner in Singapore, for example. Yeah? So they have to be able to, uh, to accommodate uh, large ships of, let's say, uh, 15,000 containers. And we are, uh, we are uh, putting some programs so that in the next two or three years, there will be at least three of them ready for that. On the national single window, uh, this is part of what we call the ASEAN, the Southeast Asian nation uh, uh, electronic platform that I'm talking about uh, before. Uh, ASEAN, uh, the home of 600 million people, the Southeast Asia countries, we are trying to uh, try to harmonize our soft side of, uh, of uh, trades by creating the electronic platform. Again, uh, one of the uh, the, the major uh, objective is trying to have uh, uh, a smooth and uh, uh, seamless distribution of uh, goods and uh, trying to, uh, as far as possible, uh, be transparent and accountable of all the goods movement. So this is an effort that now we are in the middle of that and we hope that uh, next year we, uh, we try to implement in the major parts. Thank you. Jeroen Isaac, uh Despite some of those barriers or challenges, DHL is investing quite heavily in Indonesia. It is quite bullish on Indonesia. Tell us why and tell us where you think uh, important changes are necessary. Yeah, thank you, uh, Melinda. Well, uh, first of all, uh, we're talking about uh, uh, transport. 
Um, I am transport, so I'm the one affected in the title, so to speak. Um, I'm representing more than 400,000 people in over 130,000 outlets worldwide and numerous service providers that work with us that every day improvise to get the goods from A to B. And the good news for all of you in the audience is we will get it from A to B from anywhere to anywhere. The only question is about cost, about speed, and about reliability, and there we have a lot of room for improvement. In our strategy as a group, as you quite rightly stated, um, we put a lot of focus on uh, investing in our infrastructure in the emerging markets. Now, so far the game was getting the product out of the production centers in the emerging markets into Europe and America, but the game is changing rapidly. We now have to basically accept that there's an awful lot of private consumption in the emerging markets that we have to service. So there will be a big, we are always talking about ports and airplanes when we talk about global logistics, but the, ga the, the, ga the name of the game is regionalization and a growth of domestic transport. That's a revival of trucking, whether we like it or not. That is, <laughs> that is the revival, the revival of uh, of, uh, of uh, last mile uh, logistics and that is the name of the game so we are investing in countries in the emerging markets amongst others in Indonesia but also China India in the next few years enormous amount of money to create our infrastructure now what is the biggest challenge that we see is that we would like and that's why I'm here as well at this conference is we would like to work much closer with the public sector in the affected countries to see how we can explain how the mechanics of our industry work versus um, what we need in terms of infrastructure. And I can only follow up on what you've just said. It's an awful, it's, it's great to talk about all this fancy future stuff, and I'm, I'm really excited about lots of stuff about it. But with a few simple things, we can improve our efficiency majorly. When we talk, for example, about city logistics in the world, eh, all these emerging markets, a lot of the logistics take place actually within these cities. That's where we have to deliver the parcels in. Yeah? We can have an awful lot of discussion about very smart routings and all that, but if you have no unloading base to stop your vehicle and deliver your goods at, then any smart system is not going to help you. Right? That is a challenge. If we cannot find cheap land to build a logistics facility in a big city, then the problem is we will have to go out of the city and we join the queue every morning with all our vehicles and that means we, uh, we use much more vehicles than we actually would need if we would have land within the city. And the unfortunate thing about logistics is we need a lot of space and we have, don't, do, cannot afford a lot of money to pay for it, which is not likable for project developers within a city. So the moral of the story in that sense is we are going to invest heavily, but we need help and support, and we're really willing to go into dialogue with all of the public sector to allocate that infrastructure smartly uh, before we start thinking about all the fancy stuff. A brief word, perhaps, uh, on innovative last-mile solutions that are working and that maybe show that kind of coordination uh, that you're talking about. And uh, I'm thinking, while I ask you that, about uh, some notes that I saw from yesterday's master class on urban uh, planning and design, in which one of the conclusions was we need to ban logistics trucks. Th that is an interesting thesis, I would say. Um, uh, the, uh, the, first of all, we as a, as a logistics company, uh, we are not stuck with any mode of transport, whether it be it ships, air, or trucks, or whatever. So if there are other modes of transport, and uh, we have a think tank in our group which are thinking about can we use the tube system in some of the countries or cities, basically to get goods into the town, can we use barges, can we use anything, we, as long as we find a way to balance cost, reliability, and speed, we will use it. Um, uh, and, uh, and so, therefore, we are open to that. But if you are really looking at the reality of life and the increasing number of consumers ordering goods, returning goods from private addresses, we face other challenges than think about banning trucks. We face challenges like the address system in certain countries is not so systemized that we cannot even know how to, uh, how to get to a, pri a private person. I mean, very simple basic things that are basically would make our life much easier before we start to go in into all kinds of smart and intelligent stuff which we're thinking about by the way as well. Mr. Tice, I saw you nodding emphatically uh, when the idea of using the tube was mentioned. Uh, Nestle perfectly illustrates that complexity that was mentioned at the outset of the cup of coffee that took how many different firms and how many different countries. Uh, uh, Nespresso would be your cup of coffee. Tell us something about how your supply chain has grown more complex and what kind of innovation, innovative solutions you're seeing also in terms of getting the product to the customer that last mile. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, and, uh, the 
to us, the, perhaps the two most important miles are the first mile and the last mile. And we mustn't forget the first mile. We use 10% of the world's coffee, 10% of the world's cocoa, and 2% of the world's sugar. But one of the saddest facts of all is that on average of all of those materials, between 25 and 30% is lost in that first mile. And you can extend that further to things like grains. And you think if we have a, we have a responsibility in, to feed the population of the world, then we have to lose that food waste that's there. And that food waste is primarily down to that transport infrastructure, getting it away from the fields in the first place. So it's that first mile which is important, and then the last mile into the cities. And I agree entirely, we have to use other modes. Tokyo is the best example, where the, the seats come out of the tube trains in overnight, transport the goods in, and before, you, uh, and before the commuters get back on the train um, by 6 a.m. in the morning or 5 a.m. in Tokyo, um, then the seats are back in and it's taking people in. And that's the sort of innovative solution. But I think my message would be no manufacturer, no logistics provider, no city authorities can do that on its own. It has to be a collaborative effort. And if we don't collaborate together, then we have no chance of solving either the first mile or the last mile. In terms of collaboration, perhaps uh, one word about something that is sometimes called coopetition. The idea that particularly with a supply chain that's smearing, that's growing more and more dispersed, where you have perhaps partial loads, fragmentation, uh, that you sometimes could work to optimize load by working together with competitors. Is that the case? Are you doing that? Uh, yes, we're doing that in quite a number of countries. Um, we're doing it um, in the UK, for example, with other confectionery manufacturers. And we're doing it in Europe altogether. We're putting even trains together, um, coming out of the Netherlands to go east, west, to be able to make sure that we build enough to utilize the vehicle. Because the other scandal is if you have vehicles that are at all empty. And we see awful figures in Europe of 25% of the vehicles on the roads are actually physically empty. And, uh, and that's the most terrible waste. We only get around it by working together. And we have a saying in the supply chain in Nestle that we compete on the shelf, not on the truck. I'd like to come now to uh, Mr. Rosemann from SAP because of course we've heard from nearly every panelist about how important information has become in managing these increasingly complex and sensitive supply chains. I spoke with one carrier who told me that the biggest investment they're making these days is in IT, and that is the thing that their customers demand more than anything else, to know where the product is, what condition it's in, and when it's going to get there. In that respect, would you say that we're getting to a point where reliability begins to trump even cost and price? E sorry, even cost and speed? I think, I think speed is still um, one of the most important uh, issues when it comes to supply chain. Um, nevertheless, information is absolutely crucial. Um, we, we know that, that only 20% of the supply chain professionals have the information that they need to run their business right now which is 80% do not have that. And this is, uh, in terms of speed, real-time information which is required. Especially, and I think we, we heard that before, in terms when, when um, the volatility of the market is, is really increasing, we have um, power shifting to the, to the end consumer. And to get the understanding of what that means, to get better planning in place, to get better ideas about what is the real demand, um, is, is very important, um, and I think the other, the other aspect is about the collaboration. Information can help to actually bring this together, to have the better plan in place, to get the better insight, to get the better visibility about what is going on in the network, and then make appropriate decision. I think it's about the critical decision-making to respond to this volatile markets, especially since we see that also in the regional shift that, uh, that in emerging uh, economies, um, the information about products, 
the emission uh, on, on the consumer goods are increasing as well. So information is the crucial factor, and we see that across all industries, certainly also on the logistics side as the carrier that you just mentioned. Can you give us uh, a couple of examples of particularly innovative uh, use of information systems? Sure. Um, uh, on the one hand side, um, so, so what, we, what we see is um, just take, and this is, sounds like a, like a pretty weird example, um, of, of 3D printing. Um, 3D printing is a very innovative technology um, which is shifting the entire manufacturing space. And there's an example of Barilla um, printing pasta. So this is actually, sounds weird, but this is actually uh, serve the pasta like the guest wants it, just as he needs it. Um, so uh, it is weird, especially when you're a pasta lover, but what that actually means is uh, this changes the supply chain. This changes it into much more granular demand signals. This changes it into, uh, into much more complexity. On the other side, what information can do is really get an understanding of those. So the replenishment is completely different. The transportation models are, different, are completely different, but you need to get an understanding at first from these to actually serve the consumer and the customer on that end. State Secretary Bera, I'd like to come back now um, to Germany, which in a sense is the reigning champion. The World Bank's Logistic Performance Index recently again awarded Germany the title of World Logistics Champion. Um, but that index shows that other countries are catching up and we've heard from two very ambitious countries right here that are seeing their own ratings rise. To what degree are you concerned that the kind of changes we're seeing could uh, take Germany down from the pinnacle, could uh, uh, perhaps reduce its competitiveness in relation to other economies? Um, first of all, let me say that I learned a lot today. Um, I'm very happy, Mr. De Preto, that we won't need to build an autobahn from China to Germany or the other way around. So thank you very much for that, because I think our five billion um, it, it would, wouldn't be enough what we are spending over the next years. Yeah, well, um, Melinda Crane, of course, it's always nice to be number one, but it's hard to keep it. We know that. And it's not written down in our constitution, in our Grundgesetz, that it would be number one next year or in the next two years. So um, first of all, we have a lot of factors that make Germany successful. On the one side, it's our central location, of course, in Europe, and it's we are the heart of Europe. We have a lot of countries around us, and our country is crisscrossed by many trans-European freight transport arterias. But when I hear about the other countries, of course, for example, youth is one big point. Um, so if you have very um, ambitious young people, then it's very good for the next years. We are working on that. And then, of course, um, we are working on our airports, on our streets, um, on the inland ports. They are equipped very well. And um, for now, we have well-trained, skilled workers. But um, that's nothing um, you can rely on over the next year. So um, it was very good hearing what's, to, what's going on in the other countries. So um, we really have to talk to our Minister of Finance <laughs> that we maybe get more than the five billion, I, th I assume. <laughs> What about institutional and procedural barriers here in Germany? We've heard several people talk about the role of those soft factors uh, in other countries. Are they an issue here as well? Of course, because um, in Germany we have a different system as well. We have our Bundesländer, so you have borders there already. And um, that was very interesting. And what, what, what was said um, up from, from DHL about the last mile and about the inner cities, that, was, was, that is one of the factors we are working on as well, yes particularly in view of sustainability issues. We'll come back to that perhaps in just a minute, but I'd like to ask all of you now to talk a bit about the larger issues of coordination and cooperation, and particularly how you can work together, either with, if you are in the private sector, other members of the private sector, but also in particular with other stakeholders, meaning private with public sector. Who? should be doing what uh, to support each other. And I'll start with you, Minister Anouami. We've heard a very broad 
range of perspectives here from different players in the transport and logistics game. Where do you see particularly fruitful areas for cooperation, coordination, and improvement? Right. Uh, what we have actually Can here you today... Can your mic like that? Uh, what we have uh, heard uh, today from the honorable gentleman uh, is, uh, does, not, does not give us uh, 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 an impression that the uh, the business environment is very gloomy. Uh, uh, they are running business. Uh, they are coordinating. They are cooperating with the, with the, with the, with governments. Uh, now we need the last mile. We probably we need the first mile. Maybe we need. Uh, and these are these are logistic that need to be to be to be continued. Need to be worked out. Uh, nonetheless, the business uh, of. Uh, the logistic today is, is running. Yes, it's, there are some difficulties, uh, but we always need to look at the positive picture of it. Uh, are, we, are we doing well? Uh, yes, we are improving our infrastructure. Yes, as far as public, public uh, sectors. Yes, we, we have, we have uh, things to be done, uh, but when you are in the public sector, you, you would be looking into variety of things rather than looking into the first mile of a logistic company or the last mile of, a, of, a, of another. There are many other things need to be looked at, uh, security, safety. Uh, these, are, these are issues that, that probably the logistic company might not be, might not be uh, 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 considering as much as, as the, uh, the various governments. Nonetheless, I think we have crossed uh, a wide uh, range of uh, difficulties. Uh, many barriers have been, have been uh, made uh, easier. Uh, now, further cooperation is required. Yes. Uh, do we need to formulate uh, 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 teams that could, could regulate the business between the private sector and the government, yes, it's, I think it's essential that we, we look into, into the business as, as bright. Uh, uh, the future, the future uh, should, be, should be with us. Uh, uh, it is not as gloomy as we might be thinking. Uh, there are barriers. We believe that there are, and they should be. Uh, uh, and even if we, if we overcome the problem of the last mile, we might also have another problem in the middle. Uh, but uh, future, future uh, cooperation, I think, is, is required. Uh, giving up the, uh, the, uh, the uh, working alone as individual is, I think, is essential. Uh, I believe that uh, the private sector as well as the uh, specific governmental organization should cooperate to uh, demonstrate that the issue is not uh, unsolvable. It is solvable, provided that we provide uh, uh, the right solution for it. Actually, I thought we heard pretty optimistic uh, messages in regard to particularly the development of your region. Before our, our panel began, some of us were discussing, and they mentioned one issue, labor force. You have, of course, a very large youth population. I know skills, education, and training is more and more important for the Emirates. What are you trying to do there to really bring that labor force forward? Because I know that for many of the companies that work in your region, that's one of the big areas where they feel more can be done if they have the trained labor. That is, that is, that is true. We are, we are uh, now providing uh, logistic for the uh, labor force uh, in the United Arab Emirates. Maybe it is, it is a, a hub for, uh, uh, for many uh, um, external workforce uh, that, that could be uh, that, that trained, that could be uh, uh, assisting on the, on the development. Uh, we are uh, uh, having now institutional uh, uh, activities that could train uh, uh, our boys to get the job done. Uh, we are uh, opening a new uh, maritime uh, uh, academy. Uh, to 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 probably assist in in uh, in, uh, in the maritime uh, sector, uh, as far as as the United Arab Emirates is concerned, uh, we are we are in the process and we've done a lot. Uh, nonetheless, we feel that the the business of improving the labor force and the uh, qualifying workforce to do the job is an unending issue. Uh, there there's always challenges in the in the. Uh, 
in the uh, in the uh, uh, way ahead uh, but by by uh, providing logistic and by providing uh, the right know how to the to the workforce i think we are we are we are we are a way uh, in doing that that uh, that that uh, uh, forms uh, yes there are some difficulties uh, no doubt uh, because if you if you are if you are ahead of your neighbors uh, you face problem as well because it's it's not an issue where where only a single country can solve uh, the the regional problem if we are also to cooperate with our region and that is what we are initiating uh, during the last uh, uh, decade where we need uh, logistic to cooperate with the with the neighbors where we can have uh, probably the wishful thinking of the Silk Route being 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 uh, implemented. Thank you very much. Chris Tyus, I saw you nodding your head there uh, as some of those points were mentioned. Perhaps you can uh, say something to us about those issues, but also in terms of cooperation. Well, I think it's one of the areas that we do have to collaborate on. And our industry relies on trained people. And I think we've seen a decline of training in logistics over the last few years. Much of our industry used to rely on people trained by uh, the armed forces and many of those, there are less now coming through. And I think all of us together, whether it be trade unions, whether it be government, whether it be the, whether it be the, the companies, we have to work together again to start training and really train, train the workforces in logistics. And we talked about training of drivers, how we can save energy there, but we really have to, re, uh, to rekindle all of our efforts, I think, in all the regions, and, uh, and the ASEAN region is, a, is another one there, but even, even here in Europe, to be able to retrain people in the logistics area, because we've lost the pool of people that we once had, and we have to start again. Please, uh, State Secretary Baer. Only one sentence because that's very interesting because you talked about decline of training. That's not our problem. Our problem is the population decline. So I think um, that's very important on the one side. There's a lot of population, but maybe a decline of training. And so we are lacking of population. So <laughs> maybe we can bond that together. And actually training systems, uh, the so-called dual Ausbildung, is a great German export model and in fact is being exported. Mr. Susantono. Yes, I would like to have a follow-up comments on coordination. Coordination is easy to say, but very difficult to, to implement actually. Within the government as well as between the public and all the stakeholders, right? So uh, one of the, the ways that we try to, uh, to break all the, uh, the barrier here is here is by uh, implementing the IT system, right? Uh, let me go back to the uh, national single window. This is a system that all the information of custom, immigration, quarantine, security, as well as port administrations is putting together so that everybody can uh, get all the data from uh, uh, one, uh, you know, one places where, where you know, uh, so many kind of procedures can be uh, put it in electron electronically. So in this case, the, the, again, the transparency and accountability of the process can be, uh, can be you know, uh, maintained and so that uh, everybody uh, know their roles and also their, their uh, uh, authorities. Okay. Uh, on the uh, use of IT, I think that uh, this is unaffordable because right now the middle class and the young generation, they are so addicted to that. If uh, on the logistic issues, if I order something, I would like to know where is my order right now in the real time, for example. Yeah, I ordered the book. I want to know whether my book is already, uh, you know, how many kilometers from us or still in Singapore. Or even if I order pizza, I would like to know how many minutes it's come to, to, to our house. So uh, I think uh, maybe it's not efficient yet, yes, but at least that the customer know exactly. Yeah, what is the situation? And by knowing that, they, they, they feel that uh, their, their satisfaction can increase. You know. Thank does, you. does IT help you to fight corruption issues? Exactly, exactly. Because it's, it's more uh, transparent, accountable, and also preventing direct contact between, uh, the, between all the players. Yeah? Uh, you, you, get, you pay everything on online, yeah, you know exactly how the movement of the, the, the money and uh, you, are, you don't have to uh, meet people. 
uh, meeting people, meeting all the uh, officials in the port is one of the the area that might uh, increase some corruption issues. You know, by preventing this to happen, then you are reducing the opportunity to have some corruption. Unfortunately, every human interaction has the potential for arbitrariness. <laughs> Umberto de Preto, you wanted to make a comment. Actually, there's so many things I'd like to comment on, but I'll just I'll, I'll focus first on uh, the security issue uh, mentioned by His Excellency, and, and, and that's where we can link in IT. The IRU, as a not-for-profit organization, spends every year $10 million on IT. Why? For security. The tier system is in place to facilitate trade, but it also secures trade. But we also have to secure... Uh, the fact that the IRU every working day gives $1 billion in guarantees to customs. Now, we cannot do that as a not-for-profit organization unless the system is completely secure, and that's why we need IT, that at any moment we know where the goods are, we know who is doing what with those goods. And that brings us back to the original mile and the final mile. The, the beauty of the tier system is that the goods are inspected at origin. We could be here in Leipzig, and we have a truck or a container that is inspected here, and we could go all the way to Bishkek, for example, and the goods are never opened other than here to inspect and at the final destination point to the final mile where they are inspected. And in between, they can pass every border. And the beauty with the electronic system is they don't even have to stop at the border. They should be able, once we establish tier green lanes, just to continue through and therefore eliminating the possibility of corruption. So by doing that, yes, it becomes a much more facilitated system, but a very secure system. With regards to training, 100% agree. In fact, the IRU has set up what we call the IRU Academy to train transport managers and drivers. And it's imperative in terms of increasing the efficiency of the industry, but also increasing road safety. I, I like to make the analogy with, uh, with a Formula One driver. If you put a, a completely useless car broken down on, on useless infrastructure, yet you put a Formula One driver behind that steering wheel, that driver will probably be able to, to manage it. You put us as untrained drivers in a Formula One car, we will crash it. So professional training is imperative to make certain that our professional drivers are professional. Marcus Rosenman, in terms of the security issues, is there a potential downside here in terms of privacy? All of us, of course, have become increasingly aware of the fact that big data and the just data uh, compilation in general obviously does also have the potential to be intrusive in ways that we may not always uh, have in mind. Where are there risks there and what do you do to try to limit them? Um, yeah, for, for sure, a big data has a, has a lot of potential of, of really gathering information that we today only collect and we can use that information for decision making. And, and the, these kind of platforms, just to get the visibility, I think they are very promising to get, um, yeah, to get better decisions and to get the efficiency in there. And I think also in terms of training, um, if we get these kind of procedures into IT, that helps to, to actually also standardize these kind of processes across borders globally and, and, and make it easier to to run them and, and reduce the training efforts or standardize those training efforts. Security is for sure an issue, and I think especially uh, looking into uh, things and, and processes moving more and more into the cloud, social networks being, being really ubiquitous. This, this is going to be a question, but on the other side, we have to, we as an IT um, provider have to really make sure that this is secured and, and uh, we, we really have those kind of cloud um, uh, opportunities, uh, but may that be something which is called a public cloud, or even going into private cloud, so where we have uh, uh, owners of, of the logistics backbone that secure that and have high security standards that, that help to protect the privacy, but still enable the efficiency and, and, the, and the efficiency gains out of those platforms. How can governments enhance participation in comprehensive ICT platforms? What kind of support are you looking for from governments? And I'm thinking, among other things, of an example I happen to have seen doing some work in Hamburg with smart port logistics there. Yeah, I think um, the, the, the smart port is, is a very interesting uh, concept here. Um, we have worked together with the Port Authority of Hamburg um, on a so-called smart logistics. Um, and I think this is where we have the collaborative handshake between the government uh, or the state of Hamburg and the actual logistics uh, operations at the, at the port and the hinterland. So what the smart 
port is actually doing is, is providing a collaborative and orchestrated um, effort to uh, identify the sequence of unloading of the ships to get the visibility into what's coming inbound and coordinate the road transport to it. So to actually have the communication platform and the collaboration established to advise a driver, for example, to uh, go parking 100 kilometers before the port because otherwise we would lead to a congestion in the, uh, in the, port, uh, in the port area on the roads. So this kind of collaborative approach, and that goes much beyond the pure technology and, and the pure uh, telematics idea, this goes really into collaboration and a collaborative system where we have the handshake. And this kind of infrastructure I think is very helpful and is benefiting all the logistics operations uh, the end consumer who is waiting for, for, their, for their products, as well as uh, uh, the city of Hamburg itself to, to actually reduce the traffic and coordinate it in a better way. Mr. I think a, a big part of that port to hinterland uh, coordination requiring cooperation among stakeholders, of course, it relates to intermodality. Um, often not entirely uh, satisfactory in many countries. Um, Addressing intermodality in general and integration, actually, more than cooperation, does it in some ways point to a need for greater integration within one company? Is there some impetus here for perhaps greater vertical integration to try to make sure that you can do it most effectively? Um, I'm not sure whether we really need to think about virtual integration within one, uh, within one, uh, within one company. I think uh, the challenge that we see in Europe, at least for intermodality, uh, which has been the, the promise of our logistics industry for many, many years, is that on certain routes and corridors it works perfectly well. And there are multiple players involved in doing that. Uh, that is us as having the customer behind us and organizing the various stakeholders. Uh, there is the state or the state-owned railways working with that. And for example, on the north-south corridor from the north of Germany to Italy through Switzerland, that works perfectly well. And we move lots of trucks over that over that corridor. But for example, getting from Germany into southern Western Europe is, is a challenge um, for various reasons. There are technical challenges. There are uh, challenges uh, between the fact that, you know, the locomotive driver is not uh, able to have a license in the other country, so we need to swap. And everything which then hampers the speed uh, is then going to be uh, is going to be balanced against the truck because that is most flexible. The fastest point from A to B is the direct line, and the truck can go a direct line. So every time we have to go via a railway station, and every time we are held up on that process, it takes out the speed and it adds cost. So we are balancing that against each other. Now, uh, I think there are certain corridors that work very well. We talked about the Silk Route. We are increasingly moving goods from China to Europe via rail. And that works perfectly well. It takes a lot of effort to get everybody in, in line and coordinated, including the Russian railways, and all, but it works perfectly well. We cut down the lead time, the rail track is already there, and it's just having, uh, having, having uh, um, to move that. And we move it into Poland, and then we move it on the road towards Europe. So I think no answer very clearly. I don't think virtual integration is possible. But yes, we need on certain corridors much more effort between the private and the public sector and the state-owned railway companies to deal with technical and uh, regulative uh, hemp, uh, issues that take the speed and add cost into the system because we will switch to road straight away if that is hampered. I'd like to get Chris Tice's uh, viewpoint on a, a similar issue. You do have, of course, so many different stages in your supply chain. Would it make life easier? Do you prefer to buy a bundle of services or are you perfectly happy to buy different segments from different uh, vendors? How does that work for you? Well, I, I, you know, I'd, I'd agree entirely with a colleague from DHL about the difference between different corridors. There are good corridors and there are bad corridors. And, uh, but I would bring it back to this issue of food waste um, because so much of our food is actually wasted that comes from the crops. If we just take the example that we had there of from the southwest Spain and those countries there, the amount of the soft fruit crops which are lost in the routes coming up to northern Germany, to uh, the Netherlands and the low countries, the amount of tomatoes and so on that are lost coming out from the Ukraine and those areas coming up to it. That, that's where the, the real loss is occurring to all of us because we don't have those transport infrastructures. 
I think we have to bring different parties together. No, it would be in an ideal world then maybe the vertical integration that we discussed there could exist. But, but that's not really going to. So we have to bring collaboration together. And I think forums like this can help that. Um, but we have to bring total, a total bundle of service that we can bring from let's say Spain, the Southwest, up through to, um, up through to Northern Germany without that loss of, um, of the product. And perhaps it's worth mentioning that you are participating mm -hmm. in one multi-stakeholder platform called Save Food, which is an effort to uh, address some of that food waste at the origin. And of course, DHL, a member of the Alliance for European Logistics, which is also a multi-stakeholder uh, platform trying to bundle some of these uh, issues. Uh, I'd like to move to audience questions now. So if you have a question for us, we have hostesses with microphones in the back of the room. And um, I'm going to come to you later because we, we talked about pedestrians yesterday and we'd be happy to talk about them here again. But let's see if we have a few other questions out here on supply chains. I'll take that one back there and um, raise your hand high. And I'm, I'm going, going to bundle a few questions here in the front row uh, and here. That gentleman is kindly deferring till later. Um, here, if you'll take this gentleman in the front row, please. And then there later. So go ahead, please. Okay, um, Alan McKinnon. You, you mentioned uh, sustainability. We've not said very much about that. I've been closely involved with the IPCC work recently. Um, and I think many of us are in denial about the magnitude of the carbon savings we're going to have to achieve in logistics up to 2050. Just to give some numbers, I think freight currently emits about 1.7 gigatons. Uh, on current projections, that, that will double by 2050, when it really will have to half for us to stay within our emissions. So we need very deep cuts in carbon emissions from this sector, and I'd welcome the panel's views on where you think those deep cuts are going to come from. Sure. Go ahead. Yep. Okay, if I, if I ask the biggest polluter here on the panel, may, uh, may basically <laughs> answer this question uh, at first, and maybe the others can, can, can chip in. So, um, uh, first of all, I, I do not like the word denial, if I may s be so blunt. Um, uh, I, I'm Dutch, I'm sorry. And um, um, because I think we as an industry invest tremendous amount of money and effort to think about it. And that is not because we are, we are all believing in a better society. That is simply because 70% of the lifetime cost of our operating uh, vehicles, be it airplanes or trucks, are fuel related. And we have an own interest to burn less, right? That is the first thing. The second thing, we invest in an awful lot of energy as a logistics group in technologies, in ideas to increase the load factor and also to utilize modes of transport that are more energy efficient, always within the constraints of the, what the market is demanding from us. Because we cannot teach our, um, our, our customers what to do and what not to do. Uh, we have to accept that what they, uh, what they want from us. But within those borders, we invest an awful lot of, uh, of things to that, also without our own inf in interest. And our company has set itself the target until 2020 to reduce its footprint towards 97 by 30 percent it's part of my management targets it's part of the targets of my people and we're doing an awful lot of effort where i do agree with you is is that it is an awful challenge because only less than one third of the co2 produced in the, uh, in the responsibility of DHL is basically actually produced by DHL vehicles because we have an awful lot of partners that are helping and supporting us in bringing the supply chain from A to B. I mean, you, you mentioned the example of coffee, I think, earlier. Yeah? And that means we need to find a way to get it over the entire supply chain. Now, one of the things around that is we need to create, we need to create transparency in the market about who is able to produce in a COT efficient way and who's not. <coughs> that means transparency about their fleet, transparency about the efforts they're doing in, and we are supporting an initiative in Europe called Green Freight Europe, which is basically building an independent platform on which basis we can start sort of I don't know, licensing, or and the licensing is the wrong word, but at least get transparency on, on where we are so that we can start working together with partners who are energy efficient. But I, I have to be very adamant, we're definitely not in denial. Thank you, Thank you very much. I'm going to ask for brief comments. Uh, I know Chris Tice wanted to say something. Perhaps you can say something briefly about reporting requirements from suppliers within well, your chain. Well, I think the, the answer, though, isn't just having more efficient vehicles. It's 
by utilizing the vehicles that we have better. And, and this crime of vehicles going around empty is the biggest problem that we have here in, in Europe. And we have to work together so that we have the visibility and can fill vehicles. It's co-opetition, um, as we heard earlier on. It's working between different providers. We have the actual, op we actually have the vehicles. We just need to fill them. That's the key. But do you have the data from all of the different suppliers within your chain about exactly how their carbon footprint looks? Do you have the, the, the reporting data that you need to really know how green your chain is? We have, we have lots of data. The problem is that it's not put together in the same way. Every single different provider has a different way of measuring his CO2. And if we had one single way of being able to do it between all of the manufacturing companies and the logistics companies in Europe, then we could build a much more efficient system. And Chris, if I just may add, that is exactly the purpose behind what I just mentioned with Green Freight Europe. I think to be clear, for us, sustainability equals profitability. If you're not running sustainable operations, you'll be out of business. Nobody has more to gain than the road transport industry itself than transport operators and having more efficient transport. One third to 50% of our costs are fuel. And as such, as such, nobody has more to gain if we can reduce that. Now, the IRU is committed that by 2030, we'll reduce our CO2 emissions by 30%. How we achieve that is through innovation and through training, to training our drivers. And on, we, we, we've seen how on 10%, 10%, 10%, but that includes in policy. Now, just to bring it back to the supply chain, how on earth can we reduce our fuel consumption if we have a truck that arrives at a border? And let me give you reality. That truck, once it gets to the border, can wait hours, days, even weeks. Imagine you're sitting there in a truck for two weeks waiting to get through. You're not going to move because you don't want to lose your, your place in line. That means you're just idling and just having an inch forward, inch forward. What has that to do with sustainable development? Economically, it's disastrous. For the driver, where's Amnesty International saying, this guy has been held hostage, save him. And for the environment, you're burning fuel for nothing. So therefore, that's why we need to also put in place facilitation instruments for sustainable development. Thanks a lot. Thanks for the question, Alan. Um, so here in the front row, I have a question, and also in the, in the back row, I'll take both of those. Oh, okay, you've got the mic. You go ahead, and then we'll hand it to your colleague. Well, yeah, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, we'll take both of them at once. Thanks, Melinda. Um, thanks for uh, the, their excellencies, the, the minister and uh, your guest. Uh, my question here, um, as uh, His Excellency and I mentioned, maybe the, in the case of the UAE, is establishing the, one of the top regulation now on the land transport, which is cascaded from the tier convention. Uh, and uh, part of that thing is we have classified the truck movement in, within, the, uh, within the region. I think this is where, I think one of the, uh, your guests mentioned also the skilled labor things. Uh, my question here to uh, His Excellency uh, Umberto De Breto, uh, how can the IRU help the government in enhancing these kind of uh, curriculums, if you will, and the licensing itself. I know that next week there's a, a big conference coming back, uh, coming in Dubai to do uh, the CPC ma uh, manager uh, issue. Uh, we need, I, th I think, more of uh, the non-government organizations involvement in putting the, the regulations to be a win-win situation to both the government as well as the private sectors. So this is a part of uh, uh, the involvement. The second thing, he, um, His Excellency uh, Umberto mentioned the uh, pre electronic pre-declaration by the cross-borders. Uh, how can we cope with that electronic system, with the tracking and tolling system existing ones, and link it to the big data, because we will have a big challenge in the gathering all of these big data and to analyze all of these data to come up with the right formula. Thank you very much. So I'm going to take this other question here in the front row as well at the same time, and then we'll come to you, uh, Umberto. Go ahead, please, with your question. And do tell us who you are, by the way. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, I am Pere Pedroso from Spain, uh, representing the transport sector, of course, very close to the IRU uh, as well. And uh, my question is, uh, first of all, uh, let me congratulate for a large overview about supply chain. But uh, let me back to the beginning. Uh, the beginner are cost for all of you, but for the transport sector as well and the supply chain. 
of course. I may I agree, fully agree with all details uh, you have uh, explained uh, in your position, flexibility, split, speed, procedures, etc. But why all these problems with the impact, indirect impact on cost are not reflected, by the way, for example, in the tenders, uh, that uh, the tenders may put it on, on, the, on the market. Uh, this is uh, from the IT platforms, but everything is reduced to the cost. And we never uh, have any uh, situation about to discuss between uh, the manufacturers to the direct clients in open book about the questions from procedures, waiting border times, uh, fuel uh, cost, and uh, everything about. This is a question from uh, DHL representative members and as well from the, uh, Mr. Chris Tyers from uh, the Nestle, of course. And for Mr. Umberto de Preto as well, maybe how we can uh, do something about to introduce this kind of culture to the transport sector is maybe the question to build an observatory doing all these kind of indicators according uh, to uh, training to uh, the transport sector uh, to make the direct and an indirect uh, impact cost on the final cost on the supply chain. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So I'll start with you, Umberto, and you can take a, a, a shot at both questions sure. if you would. Uh, to, to the first uh, two questions, uh, and it actually comes back to a, a discussion we're having about cooperation. The Tier Convention, as it was conceived initially in 1959, was that it was a pure public-private partnership. In fact, I would even argue that historically the first example of a, a PPP with the United Nations is the RU. Uh, in, in 49, the Tier system was created by the RU post-World War II to help uh, traffic in Europe move around. And then, of course, now it's become a global convention. But since the outset and when it became a UN convention, it was to work really between the public and the private, also for security reasons. How we choose who can operate within the tier system is with the public authorities. It is with customs. So if you're a transport operator and want to get into the system, you would not only need the approval of our guarantee association at national level, you also need the customs to say, yes, we recognize this, this person. The beauty of it as well is once you're in, you're recognized in all the tier countries. So these AEO programs that exist, in most places you have to go into a country, get AEO accreditation, and you have to do that in Germany, and you have to go and do this in the Netherlands, you have to go all over the world. In the tier system, once you're in, you're in with all the 56 countries that, that operate it. And it's recognized, so you are recognized in all these 56 countries once, instead of having to reapply in every single country. Uh, in terms of the training, this is also part of our mandate from the United Nations. When a country like the United Arab Emirates joins a tier system, it is our duty to go and train the officials, the customs officials, to train the National Association, the Guarantee Association, and also to train the transport operators so that everything works the way it should in a secure and facilitated manner. Training is the solution. And it comes back to Mr. Pedroza's question in terms of how do we make certain that the professionals know what they're calculating? And, and one of the problems, and I'll, I'll admit this within the road transport profession, is that we have too often uh, truck drivers who decide to get into the profession. They say, well, I can drive a truck, therefore I should be able to start a, a road transport company because I know how to drive the truck. Well, let me ask you, by show of hands, how many people drive a car here, a private car? Who drives a private car? Does that mean every single one of you can tomorrow start a taxi company? That's, that's the same thing. Unless you know the business, road transport is a business. And unless you can calculate your costs, you should not be in the business. And that's the problem, that we have too many that are in the business that do not know the costs, bring the cost down artificially and wrongly without knowing what are the actual costs that will be faced, whether it be the fuel cost, the maintenance costs, amortization, et cetera, et cetera. You need to be a businessman to be in this business, not just a driver. And of course, I would welcome any driver to join, but first be a businessman, first be trained. Thank so you. I'll ask for a comment briefly. I think you also asked for a comment from Mr. Tice and from you, uh, Jorun Isink. But if you would be brief, because we have several other questions out there. Thank you. Yes, so uh, first of all, thank you. Um, um, I think the, the, 
the biggest thing is we have to make sure, I, I'm, I'm a liberalist, I don't like uh, public sector intervention, we have to accept that every businessman has to take its own decisions, statement number one. Statement number two, we need to make sure that everybody's competing on the market competes against the same rules. And I think we have to think about, especially within the European market, whether everybody is competing against the same rules. And there I would appreciate the public sector to make sure that that is facilitated so that we all calculate against the same rules. We are in a very fragmented market. Everybody who has a driver's license can start this company. And with this fragmented market, obviously, economic pressures come. Um, but I think they also uh, make our industry as efficient as it is, in a way, how hard it sometimes is. So I think we need to focus in public sector to make sure that everybody competes against the same starting rules. And we need to avoid externalizing costs that have to be carried by the public sector onto the industry in the hope that we will deal something with it. I think we need to be very smart that if we externalize costs, that the taxes that are that coming in or levies coming into the government are then also spent on infrastructure and improving our sector and not flowing elsewhere in the budget. My comment would be that we have to look a little further than just the immediate tender and the immediate leg. We have to look at the whole value stream that we have. And when we look at the value stream together, and this is the value of collaboration, then we can see where the cost is really created. Are we creating a cost with, with a border, with administration? Are we creating cost in one leg by, let's say, vehicles moving empty and creating costs elsewhere. So we have to work together at the total value stream, not just the individual tenders. Thank you very much. So back here, I had a question, and then I'll take this one over here as well. Uh, good, good morning. Gavin Rosa, European Freight Leaders Forum in Brussels. Uh, Melinda, you're the best uh, informed moderator I've ever heard. I thought I might just say that at the beginning. Um, two points. Let's go back to this whole issue of collaboration. Uh, we yesterday launched a paper here at the Forum on sustainability. And one of the key things, and it's all very well talking about this IT solution, but the thing we identified very strongly in our paper yesterday was behaviour patterns. Now, uh, the gentleman from Nestle has talked about the importance of sharing loads. Now, you can, at a high level in the supply chain, say, we, Nestle, are going to collaborate with other major shippers like Mars, uh, like Bacardi, like Diageo, we're going to share loads. But you can take that decision at a high level, but how are you going to get that down to the people at the operation level who are going to have the same willingness to, on a day-to-day -day basis, collaborate on loads? And I think it's this behavior pattern we as an industry have to look at. And it's all very well with the global visions, but we have to translate that to physical action. And just another small question to the Vice Minister for Indonesia. Uh, Minister, you've got problems that we in Europe don't have. You have the tsunami problems and all the natural disasters you've faced. And I know in ASEAN you're starting to deal with that. We had the ash cloud here in Europe a few years ago. No one was ready for it. And I raised the point at the time. And I said companies should have a strategy for what is not expected. And I don't believe that many companies today have really got an up-to-date strategy on how to deal with another ash cloud. If I'm wrong, I'll be delighted to, to admit that. I think, how are you dealing with uh, natural disasters in the supply chain? I think that's a question. These are my two points, Melinda. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm just going to take, I, I, we'll come to the answer right away, but I, I'll just take another question that I had over here. Please put your hands up. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> Jose San Martin from the Mexican Transportation Institution. I was going to ask the same question about your experience, strategies in resilience and rupture on your supply chains. How, how do you cope with it? Thank you very much. Then let's go ahead and address those two. And I'll ask Chris Tyus to um, give us a representative answer on that first question about how do you bring it down from the big vision to the actual implementation. That question could go to practically anybody on the panel, I think, but we'll let you answer it representatively. I'll, I'll, I'll take the first one, and I'll, I'll give you a very optimistic answer in that I actually believe that's happening more and more than we think, because we're putting those sort of tasks on the day down to the young generation, the millennial generation, who understand the importance of sustainability, have grown up with sustainability much better than, than some of us who are doing the strategies today, 
and they want to solve these problems. They see these problems every single day and they're much more willing to work with the competitors in cooperation than perhaps some of us who've been around this industry a little longer. So I'm very optimistic. Thank you. Yes, uh, we have a, a situation when we, uh, we had to uh, confront the uh, uh, natural disaster situations. Uh, this is something that uh, not many countries experience that. And we already start to share this with uh, our neighbor in the Philippines where they hit by the, the, the typhoon. I think forum like this can be a sharing forum also. And uh, we are ready to share our recipe for that and also our best practice as, as well as the bad practices in dealing with the natural disaster. But again, let me emphasize that a forum like this can be a, a facilitating, facilitating a, a share, sharing uh, some uh, lesson learned as well as uh, 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 the training and also capacity building issues because I think that is also very important for us if I take your, your notes uh, on, on that issues because again, uh, developing country like us, we are confronted with the, the, the situation when we have to modernize our logistic system and that is why we need some skill but we are also in the middle of uh, having a situation when the job and skill is mismatched so we have to upgrade our labor uh, uh, force is, uh, capacity in order to uh, match to the, uh, the, uh, the skill that needed for the more, more modern uh, logistic situations. May I just briefly pose that disaster contingency planning question uh, to you, uh, Jeroen, I think because uh, I had almost forgotten the ice cloud, but I'm sure DHL hasn't. And I wonder, we do see predictions that we're going to face increasing the extreme severe weather patterns, whether it's global warming or from other causes, but um, to what degree do you factor that in? How can you factor that in? Um, uh, sometimes these uh, disasters come beyond imagination, right? So it is, was very difficult to predict the Iceland ice cloud, I suppose. But um, in our company, we do, as every business unit, have, have to have a disaster recovery uh, plan. There's two elements to it. A disaster happening to us, acting in a supply chain, or a disaster happening somewhere where we could serve and support uh, the consequences uh, of that and minimizing the consequences of that. And on both elements we work. So for example, when I was in the UK, we worked on a plan in order if uh, at the time there was the SAR epidemi ep epidemics is uh, to make sure that we would uh, give the government trucks to help us to get all the medicines across uh, uh, the country. So we worked on those type of plans. So we as a company work with every business unit on those two elements. Are we perfect? And how do we have the imagination about what can happen? No, definitely not. Uh, we have to improvise, but we have people, teams and thought processes around uh, dealing with that. And I think our disaster response team as, uh, as a group is also well known in some of the regions in the emerging markets. When I think about Haiti, when I think about uh, Sri Lanka at the time, uh, where we put a lot of effort in together with uh, uh, Technisches Hilfwerk from Germany in order to, uh, to support those efforts. Thank you very much. We are coming to the end of our discussion, uh, so I'm going to ask just for a very, very brief final word, perhaps, from our three government representatives. Um, as you look toward constructing supply chains of the future, our title today, what is the one trend, the one priority that you would most highlight going forward? What is the single most important thing for you, Minister Anoimi? Uh, I believe uh, that in the uh, uh, future supply uh, chain, uh, maybe the standardization is, is a, a key word, where uh, everything within the supply chain uh, has to be standardized worldwide. And if we look into it uh, very thoroughly, uh, maybe that would solve many of our problems, whether in the logistic problem or uh, probably on the manufacturing problem, or even at the decision making uh, 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 where, where, we, where, where countries fight corruption, uh, ad, uh, um, ad hoc uh, costs were added to the, to, the, to the end product. So probably if there is a key word that I would be thinking in probably looking into the future supply uh, chain is the standardization. I'll ask Vice Minister Susan Tono then uh, to give us uh, his assessment and then uh, come to our host country uh, representative, Ms. Baer, for the final word. 
I think the global supply chains need uh, a co collaborative as well as cooperative among stakeholders. That is something that unavoidable because otherwise we cannot afford to have the uh, the, uh, the seamless distribution unless we are working together. Uh, so again, we have to find a pragmatic way how to uh, implement this, how to work together, not only in the conceptual work, but also in trying to re really implement in day-to-day -day basis. Thank you very much. State Secretary Bear. Um, so Melinda, you did a great job, but now you're getting very mean, but to ask a politician to pick out only one topic, <laughs> that's very, very hard because of climate change and um, everything what was mentioned. But if you ask me to pick out only one topic, I'd say that um, big data is the resource of the future. We don't have so many resources anymore. Um, in Germany, for example, and so we really need the data and maybe then we can be number one for the next years as well. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, an optimistic end, at least as far as your country is concerned. Thanks to all of you for this very, very thought-provoking, very interesting interaction that we've had. And many thanks to all of you for your attention and your participation. I wish everybody a fruitful day and uh, enjoy your break. See you later. <laughs>